Um, my name is Laura James, Laura Jordan James, for those of you who remember me, remember me, remember me excuse me, that way. And I'm from the class of 1980, and I see a few representatives here. <laughs> 1980. And I'm so excited to be here. I had the pleasure of serving on the Centennial Planning Committee, and we wondered if anyone would come back, and you all have come back. <laughs> And I love this panel because my received history of Concord Academy when I came in 1976 at 100 years, when, it was, uh, when I was uh, a freshman, uh, was that in 1922 and in those early days, Concord Academy was progressive. <laughs> Concord Academy was not what they called at the time a finishing school. It's a place where girls were supposed to actually learn things and do things. And when my class came in, uh, boys had been with us for a few years, about four, something like that. But we had some phenomenal teachers, and some of them have been here already today. I saw Mr. Bailey earlier and others. And they helped us learn to think for ourselves and find our voice and understand that we had agency. And that's kind of what this panel is all about. We're hoping today to talk a little bit about how positive change happens, uh, what it's like to devote your professional life to making change, and what we can all do to join in the process and to kick it off, I, if you go on the line on the website, you'll see the fancy resumes of the fancy people on the panel. <laughs> I'm not gonna do all that stuff. Um, but I thought as we introduce ourselves, people can say their class year, please, and who you are, and tell what you're doing right now. But talk a little bit about what you were doing maybe as a teenager, as a college student, as a young adult. Like what's your lemonade stand for when you first wanted to make positive change? And I'll just share that for me, uh, my first experience with electoral politics was when I ran to be the student representative to the, to the trustees. <laughs> and I'm almost certain that I might have run unopposed because no one thought that was a job anybody would want. <laughs> but I thought, don't the trustees make all decisions? Isn't that where the power is? So that was the first, that was the first time uh, that I thought about that. And then that summer, uh, the Carter administration decided that young men had to register for the draft. So one of my classmates and I stood out in the hot sun, uh, handed out leaflets saying you don't have to register or make sure you're careful if you register. And then that was also 1980, the first year that most of us could vote in the presidential election. And that was exciting. We got all excited about a guy named John Anderson that most of you probably never even heard of. <laughs> so that's kind of where it started for me. And now I work for an organization uh, that's 50 years old. And 50 years ago, they decided to call themselves a name that you'll think we invented yesterday. It's called Facing History and Ourselves. Mm -hmm. All right. And I, I kind of call it, it's, it's a full-time job. I kind of call it my retirement gig because I worked in corporate America for more than 30 years. But that's, that's, that's my, a little bit of my story and what I'm doing now. But before we get into the meat of the conversation, I'd love it if my panelists would introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about how they got started. Um. Good afternoon, I'm Tremaine Wright. I am currently serving as the chairperson for the Cannabis Control Board for the state of New York. So we're rolling out regulations and licensing um, what everybody used to call marijuana, but now we're talking about, <laughs> about as cannabis. Um, and I guess for me, I, similarly, I was always in student government from I think like first or second grade. Um, and I continued through my days here at Concord. Um, but I think that the real thing, for, the real opportunity and a moment for change for me came probably somewhere around like sixth grade when I realized that there were certain jobs that women did and it all involved typing. And I did not want to mm -hmm. learn how to type. <laughs> and so I, so it was easy to be part of the organization doing things for the school, but this was the moment where I kind of found a voice for me and I was like, I'm not taking typing. And I refused, and I didn't. And I got like an extra English class or something instead of added to my um, middle school school program. And I think that that was one of those moments for me. It was like, yep, I can do it. And it was empowering. Um, so I think that that was it. I was, yes, a part of the larger community. I was a part of the um, government institution for school. But it was also finding space for me to articulate what was important to me. Go 1990. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, I'm, I'm Dave Cavell. I'm class of 2002. Um, and I think, I mean, similarly, my interest in, in public service and politics goes further back. But I think it, it wasn't so much even uh, my own uh, instinct as it was something that was just like a given. 
uh, because my mother, uh, who is here, uh, I need to confirm whether she actually read it to me. I know that she, uh, in the past, has joked that she used to read me a book called Progressive Jewish Feminism <laughs> as, as a bedtime story. Uh, I can confirm that, like one year, like in like first or second grade for Halloween, she didn't ask me what I wanted to be for Halloween. She was like, "You're going to be this," and so she put me in a in a coat and tie and put glasses on me and walked me from house to house and had me say, I'm George Bush and I'm here to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, really, it wasn't really a question of whether I would be involved in public service. Uh, it was just a question of when and how. Um, but so anyway, so now today I'm um, the director of speech writing for our wonderful vice president, Kamala Harris. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I've actually sort of, much to my surprise and probably the surprise of all of my classmates and teachers here at Concord, uh, <laughs> have been uh, working in politics and in government uh, and in public service for, for a while. Uh, and the, the sort of shortest part of the story that we can go more into is just the first person I worked for in politics was Deval Patrick when he was running for governor uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, and I uh, left what I was doing, which was teaching uh, in, uh, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx in New York, and went back uh, to work for him, which is how I got to know the speechwriters for then Senator Obama, uh, and ended up uh, in the White House with him, uh, and then uh, and now I'm back. But I think it's actually this stage where I first thought about speaking to people in public, because I, I mean, if you go out, this is humiliating, but some of the photos of me as like a 16-year-old are on the wall if you walk in here, <laughs> Um, because the, the plays I was in uh, throughout my time at CA were the, some of the first experiences I had actually figuring out, like, how do you project your voice? How do you talk to people in a room? And what, uh, what resonates with people? Um, because some of those were shows that we were writing and creating. Uh, and so I, I do credit CA and this, this stage in this room um, with helping me think that through. Um. Uh, I feel very loud. Are you louder to yourself when you're talking with the mic? Okay. Um, I am Catherine Gund. I'm the class of 1983, and those are some of my classmates. Um, and <laughs> All right, 1983. Um, and I have no long-term memory, so when, hearing you guys talk about when you were here, I do remember that I basically had sort of come out in middle school, elementary school, middle school. It didn't mean anything. It didn't get a great reception. And I think of it as I just went right back into the closet and had a miserable middle school. And my memory of coming to Concord Academy was um, like that moment in The Wizard of Oz when it goes from black and white to color. And I was just like, oh my god, here's people who are artistic and political and thoughtful and and beautiful and, you know, want to read, um, which had not been my experience before. So CA were the amazing, wonderful years. And I do think I was vice president of the school <laughs> um, my maybe junior year. And I think maybe it was Penelope Green the president. That feels like some deep memory. I didn't think I even had that. Um, so, um, but what I, I, we, we did, I didn't know what a lesbian was when I was at CA, which, go figure. Um, and I was on the women's hockey team, and I did take great pride in telling people there was no men's hockey team because it wasn't that kind of school. Um, but uh, I went on to spend most of my time in DC being uh, arrested for civil disobedience during the AIDS crisis. <laughs> And I told one of my friends that that was the only reason I was ever in DC. And she said, that's such a waste of an interesting town. So now I was just sharing my youngest child is um, an intern at the White House this year and spends uh, lots of uh, visioning time thinking about being in DC and, and working with a system to make some really important changes. And I think he would say that he also never had a choice <laughs> about <laughs> being involved like in politics or not. Mm -hmm. um, but one wonderful thing I do want to say about memory and thinking, since I can only remember things, I have very good short-term memory, 
is that one of the projects I'm working on now involves a painting that Faith Ringgold made for the women's prison in New York called For the Women's House. And to some of the points you two were making earlier, she made it in 1972. She uh, made, one of the women had said, she said, what do you want me to do? And they said, paint me a road out of here. And in the painting are women doing all these different things and they're not just things that women could do when they got out of prison or jail, but they were actually things that women on the outside also couldn't do. Um, and it, in, it yeah. included so many things. So secretary, was it Sylvia Plath said, I didn't want to take a typing. I didn't want to learn to type because then I couldn't be someone's secretary. Um, but it was, you know, women president, we still don't have, but we have Kamala, thankfully. Um, and, but it, you know, doctors, police officers, construction workers, all these different things, including bus driver. Mm -hmm. There's a woman bus driver. There was no woman bus driver until three years later. So Wonderful. anyway, time is on an arc, but we're going to try to speak really yeah, short we're, we're doing, on our we are. answers so we can we get, some get to questions. your Q and A. Yeah. Um, but I want to start actually in one of the most traditional um, arenas for making change, right? We all, this is a democracy or so we're told. Uh, and if we participate in it, we can have an effect. So uh, we're going to a little fun like debate, Scott, like high school debate team. <laughs> um, Dave is going to share kind of um, the, the opportunities to use government and politics. Uh, both Dave and Tremaine have, uh, have run for office, have served in government for quite some time. And Tremaine's gonna also kind of bring us back to the reality of some of the challenges and limitations of, of working through government. <laughs> Great, so I get to be the optimist and you get to be the pessimist. Great. For this moment. For this moment. Great, <laughs> that, well, that, that works fine by me. Okay, well look, I mean, uh, well, to your point about um, places to, to make change and make an impact, obviously there are a lot. Um, not just in government, um, but in every community in the country, in every office, in every, in every industry. Um, but yes, in government, I think we have an enormous opportunity to make change, to make things better a little bit every day for people in their lives. And I think it's, uh, it's hard to see that um, when it's as frustrating and as, uh, and as uh, difficult day to day as it can be. But even in my time in politics, which like is not all that long, even though to people like your son, it probably feels like an eternity. Um, you know, when I was, uh, let's, let's just take uh, the issue that you were talking about. The, so when I first started working for Deval Patrick, when he was governor of Massachusetts, Massachusetts was the first state in America to have marriage equality. The first state in America. And I marched with Governor Patrick in the Pride Parade in, in Boston that year, and he was the first sitting governor in America to march in a Pride Parade. Mm -hmm. And then within my time in politics, I was at the White House with the Obamas when the White House was lit up um, in rainbow colors because marriage equality was the law of the land. Um, and you know, I was, I was on the White House lawn a few months ago when we signed the Respect for Marriage Act um, and President Obama, I mean, President Obama wasn't there, but President Biden and, and Vice President Harris um, talked about the, the journey that people in this country had taken. Now, is everything perfect as a result of those actions? Certainly not. And yet, it reminds me of a piece of advice that was like very Barack Obama, um, but that President Obama would always give to us and would always, like it was sort of a theme that he wanted to think through for a lot of his remarks, which was better is good. You know, it's not perfect, but it's better and better is good. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's healthcare and the fact that 26 million Americans got health insurance uh, because of the Affordable Care Act that didn't previously have it, I mean, better is good. Should everybody in America have health insurance? In my opinion, yes. But it's better that more people have it today than they did before. And so I think, you know, when it comes to big, bold moments of change, how to advance progress for people, how to, how to do things that matter, I do think that the slow, often, as we all know, unglamorous work uh, of politics is one of the, uh, throughout our history, has been one of the best ways to make that change, um, to help people to improve things, and to attack the issues that you see in your life are unfair uh, and unjust, and to actually feel like you're making meaningful progress on them. It's slower than it should be, uh, and it's more frustrating than we wish it were, but I do think that, you know, to your point about the arc, the arc does bend, um, and, and hopefully it bends toward justice and will continue to do so. I'm gonna say I do agree with, uh, 
President Obama, and he was one of my professors, so I took ah. a couple of courses with him. Better is good, but better frustrates most. Mm -hmm. And better makes a lot of people angry and bitter because it does not resolve their problems. And I spent 14 years on a community board, which is like your local municipalities, group of volunteers that come together to advise their local electeds on what should and shouldn't happen in, the, in your neighborhood. Um, and that's what inspired me to run for office. And then I became part of this very slow process of how do we push forward legislation, meaningful legislation that's going to have an impact in people's lives. And very often it takes decades to get meaningful legislation passed. And then we fight to get a piece of legislation passed and people are defeated. They feel defeated or they're still in fight mode because it didn't take us far enough. So I think that that's also part of our problem. And we're faced with the reality and the challenge that today people are very divided. No matter if they are still all fighting for say safe housing or affordable housing, they're so myopic in their view that they won't communicate with one another about what the solutions are that they've imagined and how they might be able to make it work with someone else's vision just because better is never enough. Mm -hmm. They always want that golden, but whatever they think that it is, whatever they think that they've, they've imagined in their utopia, that's what they want. And they don't stop to have a conversation about connecting and bri building bridges between the two. So for example, in New York, we're having fights about housing. Everybody's like, oh, the rent's too high, blah, 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 blah. I am black. I am third generation Brooklyn. My family is only able to be there consistently because of home ownership. When we start passing laws that undermine what home ownership looks like for working people, it makes me angry. And I'm going, to, I'm going to dig in and push back on it. But then I have all these people who are renters, and they're having a fight about what it is to be a renter. But they don't understand that there's a, a small homeowner who will at best ever have one apartment for rent in their house. And that if they go under, you don't pay rent for 6, 8, 10, 18 months, that they've lost their home. And they've lost all of the generational wealth that they could have potentially created for families. And so. We don't talk. Those two camps don't communicate. And so it becomes in, when I have to speak the speak, an anti-black campaign. And when they need to speak the speak, it becomes an anti-renter campaign. And we're elitist and it's all of these other, it's very combative. So I think those are the mm -hmm. challenges that we face in this moment because we're not having a civil conversation. Much of the civility that's necessary for us to actually govern and to come to collective agreements is lost in this moment. And I'm not saying that because I don't think government works. I do think government works. But I think we have to have, we have to, our approach has to be about collaboration. And we've got to continuously fight the, we have to resist against the inclination to, to dig in so that we can come together sometimes. Because how, for example, housing is not cut and dry. The people that I'm trying to protect and that I'm talking about are not people that own apartment buildings with 50 units. And that's kind of small in New York. A lot of our buildings have more than 50 units, but that is a very different conversation than the families that have one. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, can, I, can that I, want to, um, I want to talk about another arena of change though, um, and, and that's, uh, do you all know who Darnella Fraser was? Hmm. Anybody know? See, and that's the person I'm going to ask my next question to. She's the young woman who held up her cell phone and recorded the murder of George Floyd. Uh, technology, yes. The reason I mention that is because politics and government is one arena, and you've heard a little bit of a debate. But media, stories, movies is another arena. And whether it's documentary and documentation, as Darmella Frazier did, or if it's Succession and whoever watched, I, don't tell me, I did not watch, I'm not caught up. <laughs> but I'd love it, Kat, if you would talk about, in the same way we've talked about how politics can be a great platform, but also candidly sometimes limiting, can you talk about the way in which any media, including the media you participate in, 
is a platform for change and also maybe can be limiting for change. Yeah, that, I mean, it would take a long time to do both sides. What I do is, you know, in terms of mainstream media and talking about that and... and Pick one for I, I'm picking a side, which is mine, um, <laughs> which is uh, I make documentary films. And part of the reason you gave a wonderful example in housing, it's so complicated. But another example was even uh, marriage. And as I said, I'm queer. And I did not participate in that part of the, of the queer movement. Um, and it was related. It doesn't mean I don't support it. And I love a good wedding. So keep me on the list. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I was very active in the AIDS crisis. I started a, a documentary collective called Diva TV, which stood for Damned Interfering Video Activist Television. We made our own press passes and we filmed for a lot of reasons. We filmed the actions and the activism today. It would be many thousands of, of images and everybody has a, a video camera. But it, um, if you remember back then, there weren't even small ones. Ours were these kind of, they weren't the big, huge, mainstream media ones, but they, you know, they were just making that transition. I think we had about five of them within our entire group of a thousand people in ACT UP New York. Um, and, and we just shared them and that was how we collectively made this. But, you know, we saw a lot of the women and people of color and more progressive people in ACT UP were in there because they could see how those issues were connected and complicated and not just because they wanted somebody who had never experienced any other kind of discrimination or never had anything else kept from them, suddenly say, you know, I, I, I need this medication, why can't I get it? We were saying, look, this is about reproductive justice, this is about the civil rights movement, and this is about universal health care. So then when, you know, AIDS response evolved, and then a lot of people, primarily straight, very wealthy white men, ended up supporting and bankrolling this really important movement, which did make a difference. I do have to say, when I came out, I was like, oh, I never have to get married and I never have to serve in the military. And for the next 35 years, that was what the mainstream queer movement fought for, those two things. And they are <laughs> both very, um, very different, very complicated, and, and the military is certainly an, um, an employment issue as well. So. You know, it, they're not that simple, but I did feel like if, you know, to say to somebody, why do you want to be able to get married? Maybe that should be between your religion or your family. And, um, and they'd say, well, I, there's all these benefits. You get 250 benefits or thousands or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And one of them is that you can be on your partner's health insurance. And I say, you know, do you think you should have to be married to get health insurance? Where's your fight when it comes to universal health care where anybody can have health care? And, and, as soon as marriage equality came through, there was no fight for universal mm -hmm. health care. Um, that's just to say that part of the reason that I make documentary films in the way I think of it, because I think of myself and our whole team, uh, we have a nonprofit film production company, which is very unusual, um, and we call ourselves an impact and film production company. We, we're creating impact and doing this different kinds of work, um, and we're using film to get there. But I also have always incorporated being an artist in that. And to me, as Ava DuVernay said in one of my films, art and justice are the same thing. They're both about looking at something that doesn't exist, a, a, you know, abolition or a blank page or something, and imagining something that can be, be there and then working to make it so. And I feel like that is the sort of messy, gritty part that me and my team um, of documentary filmmakers work to do, which is to actually address the fact that housing is that complicated, that, that liberation and sexual freedom and bodily autonomy mm -hmm. and reproductive justice are that complicated, that, that we are trying to say, yes, we might identify as an abolitionist, but how do we get from here to there? And in our films, we're grappling with those questions. Thank you so much, Kat. Tremaine, I want to come back to you. Um, if you had Barack Obama as a teacher, you've been at this a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering what you've learned about the process of, of making change. How is the sausage actually made? Um, what advice might you share for us? And also, I'm curious whether from your perspective it's getting harder or it's getting easier. 
So I'm going to say I've learned a lot about the process. I said that I spent 14 years on my community board. I think that's where most of my learning happened. Um, I learned from, and at that point, just to give you some clarity, volunteer community organizations in New York City look very much like the retiree collective. Meetings were being held at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It's <laughs> when I joined, we didn't use email. Like it, 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 so one, I, I came into a group of people who had lived a lifetime already, who knew a whole lot. They had firsthand history of all the things that I was reading about, and they wanted to tell me their stories. And they wanted to tell me what they tried and what didn't work or why it didn't work. So I'm going to say I had 14 years of people mentoring me in various walks, everything from what transportation should look like in my neighborhood to economics to what housing challenges and financing challenges look like what solutions they've created. And I was very fortunate. Um, every community probably has one. We had a person who had galvanized communities, unions, and investors, and we created some institutions. So I also had the benefit of institutional learning. And so I'm going to say, I think things are not better because I don't think that we're coming together to build collectives like that at this moment. Um, but I do think that we are continuous, we are continuing in that work and in that vein. And I'm really happy that I was able to be a part of it because I think learning from those people and seeing what the changes are right now, it's really helping me to realize that process is what's going to get us further. And being able to pick, while we might be talking about 15 issues at any given time, and we always have 15 issues that we're talking about, being able to figure out when the most opportune moment is to make progress. Um, I did not pass a whole lot of legislation, but what I've passed when I was in the State Assembly, I thought of as being really important legislation. And it was only because the irons were hot and I was able to strike. I am part of a collective, uh, it's called the Crown Collective. It's um, to legalize natural care and work and school spaces. It's happening all across the nation. Um, states are passing it state by state, similar to the way we're passing legalization for cannabis. Many people did not know. They thought, oh, everything's free to be you and me. You can go to work and do what you want. That's not the case. And if you happen to be a black woman, you needed to have a perm. I wore wigs on my interviews when I went to law firms. Yeah. I was not able to take it off and be natural until later, until I got my foot hold in that space. So the moment came, I was able to pass that law in New York State. It was the second state to pass it after California. A lot of hoopla, no. Did people really know and understand what was happening? No, but we've had at least three lawsuits already in the past three years. And think about it, kids have been home from school and all of them are school place discrimination claims. So it was one of those moments where I was able to do it. There was a lot of um, concern about women's rights and what are we doing with gender equality. So we were passing some gender equality laws. That was the moment for me to strike and say, you know what, we need to expand some other um, anti-discrimination, racial discrimination things. So just to also give you some background on me, I ended up suing the very first firm that I worked for as a lawyer. Yes, top 100, that's where I went and we went to court. So we filed in federal court and we ended in arbitration. So those issues were front and center for me. So I was able to have a lens, but I believe in small economics. I believe in um, equality for all. I believe in all of these things, but that's my vision. And so I had to, I carry that with me everywhere I go. And so I'm going to say it's not that it's easier to pass it or that it's more impactful in this moment, but it's, I had a long lesson in how to figure out when it's right. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. My, my middle son majored in leadership and public policy at the University of Virginia, and he's always teaching me. So there's some term for what you're talking about, which is this moment of striking when the iron is hot. And he explained to me how important that is. Um, where I work, you know, people don't want to talk about history, so we're worried about that. But I'm really, I love what you're talking about, the laws you were able to pass, the Crown Act and so on, because we just did an analysis, and we learned that there have been 400 laws in the last three years passed against teaching CRT or race issues, against teaching about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, book banning, L against LGBTQ issues, uh, parents' rights, quote unquote. 
only 12% of them are passing, but also there are po there's positive legislation being passed that's not making it into the news. And so I really, I really want to underscore what you've just said. Um, David, I apologize for asking this question, but it's what everybody wants to know. I mean, is it possible to make change in government when everyone's screaming at each other, when we don't all believe in the same things, when we're such a fractured society? Is, are you sure that Biden's really the president? There might have been a miscount. <laughs> I mean, uh, no. so I just, what is your take on this current polarized <laughs> situation and whether we'll ever get out of it and whether that's got something to do with our ability to make positive change? Thank you for asking me the easiest question of the panel. Sorry. I really appreciate that. That's so kind of you. Um, well, what do we think? I mean, I, you know, th this is our country. Um, and I think, you know, it is, uh, it is very hard at least for me, to reconcile the fact that this same country elected Barack Obama and then four years later elected Donald Trump president. Um, that's a very hard reality for me to hold in my hands at both times. Um, and in some ways, I suppose that's, that's part of the history of our nation, which is that there have been uh, movements for progress at the same time that there have been movements against progress. There have been people trying to expand rights and freedoms at the same time that there have been people trying to take them away, sometimes in reaction to each other, um, often the case. Um, you know, again, I think what we're talking about is the work that everyone is doing, the work that you have been on the front lines of, the work that you have been on the front lines of to try to push uh, things forward, to try to make progress, to try to make things a little bit better. I think that the story that we just heard is one of, you know, not as much progress as, as one might hope, but certainly meaningful progress, right? Is that a fair, is that a fair assumption? Yes. So, uh, you know, that's one example. And I think you know, the, in the federal government, I'm biased. I do think that, the, that this administration has been um, fairly successful at getting meaningful legislation passed. I mean, I'm thinking about the largest investment in climate in our nation's history. Um, I'm thinking about one of the largest investments in infrastructure, which is also heavily rooted in communities that have not uh, been appropriately served by government for many years that are finally, for the first time, gonna be connected with high-speed internet which is essential for learning and for telehealth and all these other things. So, you know, I, I think that there's, uh, that there's an enormous amount that can be done and is being done. Um, and it's not just at the federal government. Um, that, you know, we have uh, in the audience, Mike Firestone, who works very closely with Mayor Wu uh, in the city of Boston. Um, and, you know, I think it, in cities across America, there are opportunities for people to advance the ball, to, to, to you know, pass legislation that, might not be possible to pass federally, um, but is uh, something that's realistic in a city like Boston or in New York or in Los Angeles or in Chicago. At the same time, of course, there's the other side of the coin. Um, there are people who are trying to tear apart uh, what I would describe as the sort of foundational pieces of our democracy. Um, you know, you were talking about book bans, reproductive rights, uh, women's rights, the LGBTQ community, the like, you know, we could go down the list. Um, and so I think that, the, that what I would say is, um, you know, the, Deval Patrick, when he, was, when he was governor, one of the things he would say a lot is that we get the government we deserve. And I think we have an opportunity uh, to demand and deserve better. Um, and I think people have an opportunity next fall to do that, to make their voices heard. And if they want something better from their government, if they want to see the policies that I think many of us in this room agree are necessary, and not just many of us in this room, by the way. I mean, I will say on the point of division, a point in my campaign that I would make a lot is that if you take away the labels of a policy, I mean, Obamacare itself had like 40-40 approval with 20% undecided. If you ask people, well, what do you think about parents being able to, to keep their children on their health insurance policy till they turn 26? What do you think about people with pre-existing conditions being able to still purchase health insurance? 85% approval. And that's the truth when it comes to background checks for all gun purchases, 90% approval. That's the, that's the case with whether climate change is real and happening. Now, again, that doesn't solve all the problems that we have, but I think it's a starting place. And it's a, it's a reminder that change is possible um, if we all work together, if we tell those stories, if we vote for people who believe in these things and believe in reality. Um, and you know, if we, if we just demand and deserve better from our government. Thank you so much. Um, I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> one, of my, 
one of my favorite lines from the Obama era, don't boo, vote. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, I think it's time for questions, and I, I may see a hand. Okay. Give you a mic. Yes. <laughs> oh no, no, I, oh my God, every time, can I say, can I just say very quickly on this point, every time, he would do this thing, in presidential speaking, there's teleprompters on your left and on your right, that's it, okay, and so um, every time, President Obama, to this day, every time, when he's like speaking, and then he pauses, and he looks in the middle, no teleprompter, he looks in the middle, and he's like, but here's the thing, that's, he's not reading off of anything that's on those screens. So every, so I got so used to being like, what are you about to say, sir? Um, and, and like, I still have that reaction. Even though now, like, I'm not writing. It doesn't matter to me. He can say whatever he wants. But I'm like, so I'm still like, oh, no. Oh, no, I didn't write this. I didn't write this. It's okay. He can say whatever he wants. It's not my speech. Um, but I, are, there, are there more questions? Hello, I'm Catherine Garrett Eastman from class of 83. Catherine, I remember you well as a contemporary. We ran in the same circles. And you very kindly, the last time I saw you, hosted me at your house on Cape, on Cape Cod. I think it was on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket or something like that. It's a great time, great party. Um, so I didn't know that I was a lesbian then, and I came out only four years ago as transgender. And um, so I had some of the hormones and all that stuff. I haven't made it very far, but the pandemic was cruel. Um, but I want to ask you, I'm a librarian by trade, and uh, I work at a college. And we're very interested in archiving our history, at least I am. But I'm very interested in what kind of archives from your time, like the AIDS and ACT UP and, um, you know, the history of lesbianism and um, what what's available digitally? What do you know of both? That's a fascinating question. It's great to see you. Thanks for um, coming and for asking questions. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because we talk about archives all the time because we talk about impact. You know, it's Darnella Frazier, right? She held that camera up. That child did not take that camera away. She not only had to watch it, she stayed with it. Um, I'm in the academy, I'm in the doc branch of the academy. Some of us pushed for her to get the academy award that year. They didn't go for it, but they did recognize her because that kind of participation is so invaluable. And I'll say uh, one example, you know, to the idea that we all have to work together, the inside game, the outside game, the alternatives, Whatever it is, Brian Stevenson mm. once said, you know, um, legislative change is downstream from narrative or cultural change, which is what we're trying to do in telling these stories and keeping them going and linking them, telling them in a way that does bring history along, that does recognize the complexities. And his point was, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, kids could go to school or go to school together with children of different races, but it did not end racism. And what is gonna end racism, you know, that what's going on now, one of the examples that Lara gave, which is about the CRT, someone said it so clearly to me the other day, they said, we used to not be able to learn how to read and write, and now we can't learn that we weren't allowed to learn mm -hmm. to read or write. And that is what the attack is that's going on now. And the more that we can create imagery and, you know, just seeing, it, we, we saw Rodney King didn't make a change. You know, we've seen, we've seen too much of it, in my opinion, and I don't even think we need to see it anymore. Somebody carried a sign in New York that said, they're not arresting, they're not upset because they saw the video, they're upset because you saw the video. Mm -hmm. And that videos existed, the reality exists, we don't need more research into these things. I mean, we do, nobody should stop. <laughs> you know, writing books and making movies and researching that kind of thing and keeping the archives. What we need is to figure out ways to show that, to tell that, to inspire people to vote, to get people to understand complexity, to get people to talk to each other. You know, there's no, uh, Brian Stevenson's other thing is about proximity as well. Like, if you're not actually talking to the person, that is what they say created marriage equality, is that people were, you know, when they said, oh, it's a right, people were like, no, let's not get into rights. As soon as they said it's about love and family and your coworker and your aunt and your kid and your this and that, people from all sides of the aisle were like, yeah, I love that person, they should, they're fine. Right. That is what changed it. And that potentially could change a lot of other things as well. Thank you.
Um, I'm Erica Levine Powers. I graduated in 1961. <laughs> I, <laughs> I lived in Concord for a number of years. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. One is that when I was in eighth grade, Livingston Hall, who was then the headmistress's husband, took the eighth grade to town meeting. We were told we had to sit in a specific area and we couldn't scratch our heads because people might think we were voting. <laughs> and we watched the debate for uh, the bond issue for the school, for the high school, which was why we were taken there. But before we were, we saw democracy in action because the question was whether to have public toilets at the battleground. And they were called comfort stations, and Livingston Hall had been put in charge of a group of Boy Scouts who were looking for fecal material around the battleground because it was considered too delicate for the Girl Scouts. And he made a report about comfort seekers, comfort finders, and so on. That, and, and in a wave of laughter, after some little old lady stood up and said that when her ancestors fought at the battle, there were no comfort stations and therefore there shouldn't be any. <laughs> uh, that passed the school bond issue, which was supposed to be very controversial, passed and so on. Okay, that's one thing. I tell this story to the people who are in charge of the curriculum at Concord Academy right now. And part of the story is, get the students to watch voting. Get the students to go to town meeting. Get them to see how sausage is actually made. Um, when I was on the staff, well, I was the treasurer of the Democratic town committee in Concord years later. I was told because I was a good cook and they were running at a deficit and, you know, and I could make nice fundraisers. Um, I discovered that high school students could be sent if you, if the Democrats were running an election, you could get high school students and the Republicans also got the same number of students. And those students who couldn't vote sat on my dining room floor and made signs, and I taught them that you don't trash the other side's signs because you might have to go to the bathroom too. And um, we had, for, eight, for Evelyn Murphy, 400% greater vote for, in the primary than some of the Boston districts. Get the kids organized. They will learn. Thank you so much. Um, apologies, we are we are we are out of time, oh. and I'm going to take the prerogative of having the last word. Um, I work at Facing History and ourselves, and our mission statement says we use lessons of history to challenge teachers and their students to stand up to bigotry and hate. But your story and your comments are reminding me, we just released a curriculum about Emmett Till. It's called The World Should See. And you mentioned Rodney King. And we've been speaking about Darnella Frazier and George Floyd. This is the work of every generation. So while we hope at Facing History that we will finish our work at some point, we probably won't finish our work. Because unfortunately, in each generation, there are people who will be operating against us. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep going. And as you said, we need to have the students watching voting in every generation and seeing these films and having these meetings and working in government in every generation. Thank you for coming. Thank you.